I'd like to welcome all of you to NPAP's third meeting of our yearly series entitled Instinct or Intellect Must We Choose. Um, the series celebrates Theodore Reich's 120th birthday and NPAP's 60th anniversary. My name's Carl Jacobs and I'm program chair at NPAP. And tonight's meeting is co-sponsored by NPAP and the New School for Social Research Department of Philosophy, Simon Critchley Chair. And I'd also like to thank from the New School, Mary Doctor, Claire Martin, and Pam Tillis, and Lisa White from Fora TV, who is webcasting the event this evening. Our next and final meeting of this series will be here in this auditorium on Friday, March 13th, at which Maurice Prater will be giving a PowerPoint presentation of his ongoing research with Donald Klein at Columbia entitled Panic, Separation Anxiety, Suffocation, False Alarms, and Endogenous Opioids. A mouthful. <laughs> I, uh, um, Ma Maggie Zellner will be the discussant. And speaking of mouthfuls, the last announcement is you're all invited for a, coll a collation after the meeting on your right. Okay. My right. For the past 15 to 20 years, psychoanalysis has endured controversy from both within and without. This is not a new occurrence. Our history is rife with unanswered questions and controversies. In fact, most of the basic tenets of psychoanalysis have been debated over and over and never seem to be quite resolved. The most recent incarnation of our controversies was succinctly summarized in a 2002 JAPA article by Monroe Prey that was entitled, The Classical Relational Schism. From the earliest dissidents, Ferenczi, Sullivan, and our own Theodore Reich, through the mid-century theorists, Bion, Lowald, and Kohut, to the present, Mitchell, Rennick, and Stallero, we have all, in some way, engaged the postmodern and linguistic turns of human thought and emotion about itself. What I have noticed over the past 10 years or so, however, is a new yet subtle shift to what I've called the new integrationists. Analysts who are using interdisciplinary modes of communicating both new and long-held tenets of their fields of knowledge in order to define a space in which we humans, on whatever level, will be able to understand each other psychodynamically. Nowhere more than in philosophy, with writers like Whitebook, Cavell, Critchley, and Jurist, has this been more evident, as can be witnessed by our presenter this evening. The one exception may be the recent neuropsychoanalytic focus on the combination of affective as well as cognitive systems approach. Donna Orange has chosen to address our theme this evening, instinct or intellect must we choose, by attempting to reach beyond it. Through her thorough understanding of two fields of knowledge, psychoanalysis and philosophy, she has uniquely bridged the apparently unbridgeable. It's also my belief that of all the theories which fall under the encompassing umbrella we have come to know as relational, that is, interpersonal, self, object relational, etc. It is to my mind the notion of intersubjectivity that will endure most forcefully over time. Donna Orange has been at the heart of the intersubjective schema. She has co authored two most important works with Robert Stallero and George Atwood Worlds of Experience, Interweaving Philosophical and Psychoanalytic Considerations, 2002 and Working Intersubjectively, Contextualism in Psychoanalytic Practice, 1999. 
as well as authoring her own book, Emotional Understanding, Studies in Psychoanalytic Epistemology, 1995, and in press, Thinking for Clinicians, Philosophical Resources for Contemporary Psychoanalysis and the Humanistic Psychotherapies, 2009. Dr. Dr. Orange is faculty, training, and supervising analyst at the Institute for the Specialization of Relational Psychoanalytic Psychology in Rome, as well as faculty and supervising analyst at the Institute for the Study of Subjectivity here in New York. She is on the editorial boards of numerous journals, including Psychoanalytic Psychology and the International Journal of Self Psychology. Dr. Orange maintains a private practice and she vacations in the great state of Maine. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Donna Orange. Thank you, Carl, for your very gracious introduction and for alluding to our tie to Maine, our common tie to Maine. Is this about right? The a little louder, okay. Okay. It is a great honor to have been invited to participate in this distinguished NPA, NPAP lecture series here at the New School for Social Research, a place whose tradition and inspiration I so cherish. I feel the presence of ancestors like Hannah Arendt and Hans Jonas, as well as the ongoing, although for me, Good. Okay. Um, I feel the presence of ancestors like Hannah Arendt and, and Hans Jonas, as well as the ongoing, although for me, sporadic opportunities to learn from giants like Richard Bernstein and Simon Critchley. You have brought me back into philosophy, and I am deeply grateful. Thank you also especially to Carl Jacobs of NPAP and also to George for inviting me and to George Hagman in advance for his discussion. The topic of this series, must we choose between instinct or intellect, thought or feeling, drive or object, struck me forcibly. I realized that most of its terms, instinct, intellect, drive and object, never appear in my clinical or theoretical thinking or writing, despite my respect for the developmental rethinking in the work of Hans Lowald and others. As for thought and feeling, I use them informally all the time, but almost interchangeably. If a patient cannot respond to, how does that feel to you, I may next try, well, what do you think of that? Or do you have a theory about that? Or what is your sense of that? In other words, as a clinical matter, I try to find my way into the patient's language game. But I rarely find this language to be that of instinct, intellect, drive, or object. In my writing, these terms drop out because they come from experience distance theorizing that most phenomenologists and Wittgensteinians detest. Phenomenology rejects both the tendencies to reify and reduce, as well as to hold or hide assumptions about a representational theory of mind, currently, by the way, enormously popular among British theorists of mentalization. Having redefined representation to exclude obviously naive image theories of mental contents, you know, that we have copies of, of things in our experience, in our heads, that like the early empiricist philosophers imagined. Having redefined representation to exclude obviously naive image theories of mental, mental contents, 
representationalists like Fodor and Searle still fail to notice that perception and thinking involve embodied engagement with, in, and of a world. Instead of an extensive critique of the old theories, however, or even of the fashionable ones, I would like this evening to offer you some indications of what a phenomenological sensibility might look and feel like, both theory-wise and practice-wise, in contemporary psychoanalysis. <coughs> Putting aside for the moment all the recent talk about, you know, classifying talk about Freudians and Kleinians and relationalists and intersubjectivists and even of Cartesians, let us just consider what it might mean to think and practice psychoanalysis in a phenomenological spirit. I think it means at least three important things. One, a focus on lived experience that leaves aside brackets or, bracket was Husserl's term, brackets or suspends our interest in the dualisms foundational to modern philosophy and classical psychoanalysis, as well as in the facts studied by the natural scientists, sciences. So we put aside our interest in the dualisms and in the, 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 in the facts, not so much in the facts as facts, but it, as whether or not it's a fact, whatever the it may be. Secondly, we view relatedness as our primary human situation, and specifically IU relatedness as the condition for the possibility of integrated subjectivity. And third, uh, in a phenomenological spirit, we embrace the indispensable asymmetry, yes, this needs explaining, of our work that leads phenomenological psychoanalysts and therapists to live out the quiet discipline of placing ourselves in the background. Tonight, the third of these will occupy us the most, but the first will come first. The focus on lived experience. Many 20th century European philosophers, from Husserl through Levinas, saw philosophy itself as a phenomenology of lived experience. As a result, they tended to engage, confront, and attempt to understand both empirically-oriented psychology and Freudian psychoanalysis. Edmund Husserl, universally acknowledged as the founder, now perhaps the grandfather, of phenomenology, began by challenging what he called psychologism, that is, the tendency to give genetic explanations in science and mathematics. Now, of course, it does seem clear that the truth of the Pythagorean theorem does not depend on how I learned it. So, he said, back to the things themselves. Look, let's look at what we're talking about, not how I learned it. He taught us to bracket our preconceptions about existence, about whether the thing is really real or not, so that we could describe and re-describe our experience so that the meanings or essences could appear in what he called the intuition of essences, Wesenschau, or Wesenschauen. But Husserl's perpetual beginner attitude in philosophy. Not for nothing did he leave 40,000 pages of unpublished manuscripts. Gradually led him to think that our meanings, he often said essences where we might say meanings, must take shape in a life world. Internal time consciousness, his expression for our sense of experiential continuity, constituted this life world for us. Intersubjectivity, ever an increasing focus for Husserl, was the form that experiencing takes within a life world. It is a task of the highest importance, Husserl wrote, which may actually be achieved 
to feel our way into a humanity. That's a nice expression. To feel our way into a humanity whose life is enclosed in a vital social tradition and to understand it in this undivided social life. So that increasingly Husserl saw the phenomenological project as an intersubjective one and as understanding within a life world. He went on, this is the basis of the world, which is no mere representation, but rather the world that actually is for it, for humanity so that it's the world for us, not a world out there or a world as it is in itself, but a world for us. But the central and lasting legacy of Husserl is his insistence on the focus on lived experience, always back to the things themselves, that is, to the experience. His famous bracketing, or the other word that he often used was epoche, the, uh, which is a Greek uh, synonym, or reduction. Reduction, by the way, did not mean bringing down. It meant leading back, as in the Latin, reducere, to lead back, to lead back to the things themselves. His famous bracketing, epoche, or reduction was a kind of thought experiment to make the focus on experience possible. Husserl's philosophical children were German and French, primarily. Max Scheler, for whom the life world became the logic of the heart, largely disappeared in the shadow of the massive presence of Heidegger. Heidegger, challenging Husserl's perpetual beginner approach, claimed in Zeinen's sight, being in time, that we are always already worlded, that we do not find or create a world, but are thrown into our world and never exist without it. Our emotional experience, or Befindlichkeit, how we find ourselvesness, it's a very awkward word, but a very rich idea, is uh, our emotional experience is always of finitude, thus of angst or being toward death. Temporality defines our human being in the world. An important caveat here is that where I am saying our world, Heidegger would have said, my world. Jemeinigkeit, or mindness, defines authenticity for Heidegger. <coughs> the French, I'm going to go swipe one of those waters. <coughs> the French phenomenologists included Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, as well as Ricoeur and Levinas. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, down here. All studied Husserl closely, and each had to come to terms with Heidegger's gigantic philosophical presence, as well as with his atrocious political choices that have constituted an ongoing trauma for continental philosophy. Merleau-Ponty, for example, explicitly allied himself with Husserl, but then developed a phenomenology of the etre au monde, much closer to Heidegger's. In his understated style, in Merleau-Ponty's uh, understated style, the Frenchman cast his critiques of both uh, Husserl and Heidegger as interpretations, thus his own quite original understanding of embodied intersubjectivity both body and intersubjectivity are missing in Heidegger. Merleau-Ponty's own original understanding almost faded from view. For Merleau-Ponty, who understood Husserl through his studies of Gestalt psychology, body is my being in the world and through perception. 
Body means the inevitability of a limited perspective on the world I inhabit and that inhabits me, and completely precludes the possibility of a self-enclosed cogito or of a God's eye view. This, this actually deserves more time than I'm giving it here. That body is what creates perspective. I can't escape the place where I am situated and what that creates in terms of the limitations of what I can perceive. So that the acknowledgement of my own embodiment, also in relation to yours, means also an acknowledgement of my limitations, of my finitude, of the limitations of what I can perceive and understand. And it makes me completely dependent on the conversation with you if I'm going to understand more. I can't escape my embodied perspective without engaging with the other. Empirical studies only suggest perspectives on subjub subjective experience, which can never be reduced to anything else. Long a student and teacher of child psychology, Merleau-Ponty developed in his last years a philosophy of the flesh, neither mind nor body, that refuses the dualisms of mind and body, self and world, subject and object. Instead, he saw the visible as emergent from the embodied and preverbal invisible, the embodied and preverbal invisible. It, he's using invisible as a noun there. As do many of the chaos, complexity, and systems theories that inform contemporary developmental research. You can think about Dan Stern and Trevarth and, and um, the Boston Study Group, and many of others. Although both Sartre and Ricoeur wrote about psychoanalysis, Merleau-Ponty and Levinas, to whom we will return, have contributed the ideas most formative for my own understanding of a psychoanalytic phenomenology. But diverse as they have been, the phenomenologists have all started and finished with lived experience. The entire method or sensibility rules out the Cartesian isolated mind, the Kantian a priori, and most, if not all, versions of mental representation. The life world, being in the world, embodied intersubjectivity, these constitute the primordial ground for the phenomenologists. Let us consider for a moment what a phenomenological sensibility precludes, what it rules out, what it doesn't like. First of all, rationalism. The rationalistic self-enclosed mind has held modern philosophy and psychoanalysis captive. We won't even talk about cognitive behaviorism. That's <laughs> aside. Heidegger, probably rightly, saw even Husserl's work as continuing the split between the subject and the things themselves. And he insisted that there is only being in the world. Psychoanalysis, for its part, with its emphasis on reality testing and distortion, has embraced the picture of mind as representing or misrepresenting independently existing reality. Cognitive neuroscience, in an amazing feat of conceptual elegance, often claims that brain replaces mind and that experience is irrelevant. Carl was telling me over dinner that affective neuroscience is not so bad, though, that I need to study that. Um, once again, the in the empiricist tradition, only what can be weighed, measured, and imaged counts. Instead, phenomenologists like Hubert Dreyfus see the human being as a life as see human being as a life of learned, skillful coping in worlds within which we more or less get a grip. 
I recommend Hubert Dreyfus to any of you who are really interested in pursuing some of these ideas. He has written about uh, Merleau-Ponty quite a bit, and I'm reading right now a little book called On the Internet. And the chapter I'm reading right now compares learning in a classroom or in a, an apprenticeship situation, like the way we do with supervision in psychoanalysis, um, where there's a, a, a real embodied presence of the other, or actually the analytic situation, with learning on with online learning, and says, "All right, what what is lost here?" and and it's very, very interesting, his analysis. And he tries to think about what would it take to make online learning as good as being right there with the professor or the, you know, the teacher or the mentor. And so if you're interested in pursuing this, this little book called On the Internet is something I'd recommend to you. Um, you really can get the spirit of this embodied intersubjectivity, that, uh, this phenomenological idea that I'm talking about. Um, psychoanalytic phenomenologists no longer concerned with inside and outside realities focus on and within the field, the system, the intersubjective. <laughs> Second, a phenomenological spirit rules out the Kantian subject, the a priori who comes to the experience. Uh, for those of you who've studied some philosophy, you'll remember that the, the Kantian subject brings the categories and the space and time and so on to the experience and, and together you have uh, to the, that is to say, to the sense data, and, and, and together you get an experience, a synthetic experience. The Kantian subject who brings a priori forms of space and time as well as the categories to whatever is given also falls away in the phenomenolo phenomenologist's world. The subjectivity of phenomenologists and also of Levinas <laughs> is a minimal subjectivity. The sense of self-familiarity glimpsed in the background of our embodied engagement in our worlds of experience. Nothing as strong as the ego of ego psychology. It more resembles the Sartrean pre-reflectivity pre or the Buddhist non-self. It's, it's not a big, strong, agentic <coughs> self. Uh, that or that we're looking at with a f with the phenomenology. Third, as we've already suggested, phenomenologists reject rationalist, intellectualist, empiricist, and cognitivist accounts of ideas as representation. Here we find their enduring challenge to the modern philosophy of mind, even and especially in its contemporary reincarnation as cognitive science that amalgam that includes philosophy of mind, artificial intelligence, and cognitive neuroscience. By contrast, I am struck by some British uses of mind as a verb. If I was in England a few months ago, and I heard over and over again, mind the gap between the train and the platform. Mind is a verb, and it's very embodied. It has to do with paying attention to a, a relationship between your body and the whole surround. Mind your manners. You know, mind, mind, mind. It's not a noun in these uses. These uses point to minding as a skillful embodied coping in one situation, world, or environment. Instead of a theory of mind, a child learns, needs to learn her way about in the various worlds she inhabits, including involvement with human others. Phenomenology sees representational theories of mind and of mentalization as far too concrete to capture the immense complexity 
of the myriad small adjustments required for everyday coping. So what does phenomenology offer us clinicians to replace rationalism, the Kantian subject, and representation? It offers a complete shift of focus. The primacy of lived experience means that as psychoanalysts, we concern ourselves with what our patients are suffering. We attempt to understand that suffering, including their ways of coping with it until now, through our own situated and limited lived experience. We try to notice when our patient feels that we make him or her an it, reducing, observing, diagnosing, judging, knowing better, controlling, distancing, and when we seem to connect as a we, the I and you of genuine dialogue of communion. Instead of treating depression or psychosis, we undergo the situation with the other. That's Hans Geir Gadamer's expression. Carrying our preconceptions, personal, cultural, and theoretical, as lightly as possible, we attempt together to make sense of to understand the patient's suffering within the always already living relation in which we find ourselves and which we continue to develop together. It is written that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Unfortunately, in our work with devastated human beings, more often we weep. The primacy of relatedness is the second big aspect here. Working phenomenologically also means seeing relatedness as our primary human situation. This means that we are born into relatedness and that our coping capacities and our tangles develop, maintain, and transform relationally. Both agency and suffering are always situated emotionally and temporally. Aging and dying means we are gradually losing our grip. Our work becomes a surrender to the loss of a sense of agency in the relational worlds that have enlivened, sustained, and troubled us. At every moment, the phenomenologist will meet the patient within complexly nested life worlds, more or less shared. We share common humanity with all its potential for good and evil, and we are the other to each other, the you that meets the I in mutual dignity and reverence. I am human, said Terentius, and nothing human is alien to me. In psychoanalysis, the relational movement, broadly including self-psychology and intersubjective systems theories, has supplanted some aspects of the rationalist program. We now see both trouble and cure as grounded always and unavoidably in relatedness. Developmental theories that emphasize mutual regulation and attachment, ex attachment experience have replaced the stage theories and views of individual developmental arrest. The unconscious as location of id in instincts and their derivatives has given way to an emphasis on dissociative processes that protect us from seeing and feeling what seems unbearable. We intersubjective systems theorists and clinicians now focus on the organization of experience according to emotional convictions or organizing principles formed in relational worlds of psychological trauma. To the extent that we work phenomenologically we engage and notice that we engage with our patients, not just observe them. Now I'm cutting this section shorter because w our group has written so much about this, about the organizing principles, about trauma, and, and the engagement of the analyst subjectivity in the process. And so, um, I'm leaving that for now to go to the third big section on ethics and asymmetry, the work of Emmanuel Levinas. 
in part because at the moment that I was asked to do this, this is what I was immersed, was immersed in. I believe that the phenomenology-inspired ethics of Emmanuel Levinas can provide clinicians a reason to go on in the face of the sorrows to which our work exposes us with fewer certainties. That is to accept that we have to go on without the certainties. But his philosophy was so bound up with his life experience, making him a strong candidate for a psychobiographical study in the style of Faces in a Cloud, that the Atwood and Stollero's early work, uh, doing uh, psychobiographical studies of uh, Freud, Jung, uh, Rank, and Wilhelm Reich, and showing that their life experience and their theories were strongly connected. Um, I'm suggesting that Levinas would be a candidate for such a study. I think a lot of philosophers would, actually. Anyway, the, I'm going to tell you something of his life story as a result. Emmanuel Levinas was part philosopher, part Talmudic scholar, and part prophet. He refocused phenomenology on the sphere of ethical experience. Born in Lithuania in 1906 into an intellectual Jewish milieu, Levinas and his family moved to Ukraine in 1914 and returned to Lithuania in 1920. He studied in Strasbourg and briefly in Freiburg with Husserl and Heidegger, his early inspirations in phenomenology. He became and remained a lifelong phenomenologist. In his words, the phenomenological method enables us to find meaning within our lived experience. Like many others, he was caught up in the fever generated by Heidegger's early philosophy of being in the world and throughout his life valued Heidegger's account of affectivity for its worlded relationality. Already a serious admirer of Bergson's account of Duret, lived duration, not clock time, in Time and Free Will, the young Levinas was also drawn to Heidegger's understanding of human being, Dasein, as temporality. His doctoral thesis, Levinas's doctoral thesis, had introduced Husserl to French philosophers, but in shock and horror, he abandoned his book on Heidegger when that philosopher joined the National Socialists and as Rector tried to impose their program on Freiburg University in 1933 and 1934. In 1930, Levinas became a French citizen and in 1939 enrolled in the officer corps. In 1940, he was imprisoned in a labor camp near Hanover for five years until the war's end, while his wife and daughter were hidden by nuns. All his Lithuanian family was murdered. My life, he later said, has been dominated by the memory and the presentiment of the Nazi horror. After the war, he was largely involved with Jewish education in Paris, but also wrote philosophical works. Totality and Infinity, an essay on exteriority, his first full attempt to articulate his point of view, was published in 1960. By 1967, he was professor at the University of Paris, along with Paul Ricoeur. Having taken into account Derrida's critique, you are using Heidegger's language to refute Heidegger. In 1969, he published his second magnum opus, Otherwise Than Being, or Beyond Essence. If I had a blackboard here, I'd write a couple of things up here, to, but I'll try to explain some of the concepts in these two books. Many books and lectures later, he died in 1995. Interest in his work has grown immensely since his death, in part because an ethical void was left by postmodernism, in part because Habermas and Rawls had developed rationalist theories of liberal justice, equal treatment ethics, without an ethics of the infinite value of every individual human being. The much-needed work of Levinas addresses this gap. The big idea of Emmanuel Levinas was, in the words of Simon Critchley, and I'm glad he's not here tonight because he could explain this much better than I. Um, 
although it, it would be an honor to have him here because he really taught this to me. The big idea of Emmanuel Levinas, in the words of Simon Critchley, is that ethics is first philosophy, where ethics is understood as a relation of infinite responsibility to the other person. Now, uh, let me unpack that a little bit. First philosophy is an expression that comes from Aristotle and borrowed very much by Heidegger to refer to the study of being. Being itself is, the, is supposed to be the first and fundamental question that philosophy is about. Levinas says, no. The ethics is first philosophy. Eth the, good, the question of the good comes before the question of being. To understand this idea, we must remember that Heidegger, for whom ontology, the study of being, was everything, used his philosophy to support the regime that imprisoned and enslaved Levinas for five years and murdered all his family. Levinas became convinced that something otherwise than being or knowledge must be fundamental. He contrasted what he called totalizing, or treating others as something to be studied or comprehended with relating to the face of the other. This is the key expression, the face of the other. And he, he was extremely sensitive to modes of thinking that put people in classifications, not only because racism had been such a big part of the National Socialist Program, but he began to see that any kind of classifying people was the same problem that he called totalizing. Treating others as something to be studied or comprehended. The relation to the other can never be reduced to a relation of comprehension, he said. Instead, this irreducible face always transcends our concepts, categories, representations, and ideas. Quote, the way in which the other presents himself, exceeding the idea of the other in me, we hear name face. What he's saying is that whatever my idea of you is, the, um, what he called the nakedness, or the nudity, or the vulnerability, or the destitution, these words of the face, escapes and transcends the concept that I have of you. Face is and is not something that can be photographed. Face is not so much something I see, but something I speak to. And the primary word that I speak to the face of the other is in Hebrew, hineni. Those of you who know some Hebrew will know what that is. Here I am is the way it's usually translated, but it has also been noted by some translators that, that's, that it's more accurately, it's me here. It's not exactly, uh, once again, it's not a strong I. It's, it's, it's only the I as a respondent, not the I as an actor or as an agent or as a strongly subjective subject. The other, the, and the word that's often used is otrui, um, a, uh, in French, A-U-T-R-U-I, almost all, always uh, capitalized, the human other presents me with an infinite demand for protection of, and care. The face of the other presents me with an infinite demand for protection and care. The face says, you shall not kill. You shall not leave me to die alone. Levinas contrasted his sense of the height, and this is one of his expressions, the height of the other. The fa uh, one of his essays was, was entitled Transcendence and Height. 
And by that, he meant that the other is above me ethically, not at the same level. This is the asymmetry idea that, we, that I referred to before. The other is above me ethically, it transcends me ethically. The demand that the other places upon me is infinite. Levinas contrasted his sense of the height of the other with, his, with the description of the other. And there are two others here, this autrui, which is the face of the other, with the other that can be described, which is a lowercase autre in, in, in French, which, can be, which is objectified and, and reduced and totalized. And he often spoke of this as reducing the other to the same. Um, that that he, he's, uh, the, the same can be described, can be classified, can be totalized, and can be murdered. By height or transcendence, he meant that the other in his need or destitution and destitution always exceeds me and places an infinite ethical demand on me, even a persecution. Levinas used, it, used very, very strong hyperbolic metaphors, if you will, to make his point. I am persecuted by the face of the other. Because the, the destitute suffering in the face of the other does not leave me alone. Can't, doesn't leave me to be comfortable, ever. This relationship to the other creates what Levinas called a curvature of intersubjective space. There would be no, no place in Levinas for the, the contemporary emphasis on mutual recognition. That's too even. You know, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. You know, I, cre I create you by my recognition and you create me by your recognition. This is, not, this is a whole different world we're talking about it now. In the curvature of intersubjective space and the height and transcendence of the other over me. What can this mean? The ethical relation is not between equals, but is asymmetrical. And uh, that is from inside that relation, as it takes place, these are Critchley's um, words now, at, as it takes place at this very moment, you place an obligation on me that makes you more than me, more than my equal. Uh, now these are my words, because I cannot expect the same responsibility without limits from the other toward whom I bear it. Society is needed. We need the support of society. The other, says Levinas, stands in a relationship with the third party or society for whom I cannot entirely answer even if I alone answer before any question for my neighbor. Levinas is hard to read, by the way. You have to kind of keep reading him over and over. Justice, society, the state, and its institutions, exchanges and work are comprehensible on the basis of proximity. I'll explain about proximity later. This means that nothing is outside of the control of the responsibility of the one for the other. In other words, we need law, justice, and equal treatment ethics like Rawls and Habermas the fundamental ethical relationship of proximity to the neighbor is so radically tilted and irreversible as not to seem equal in any phenomenologically describable way. So we need the law, we need the equal treatment ethics, but the face of the other creates this curvature of intersubjective space. To understand what Levinas had in mind, we must remember that he told us in many places how decisive for his thought was the experience of what he called Hitlerism and what Derrida called the worst. If you read much Derrida, you, can, you run across, especially the later work, you run across these references to the worst. He's talking about the whole 
1933 through 1945. Levinas dedicated his second important philosophical work, Otherwise Than Being, quote, to the memory of those who were closest among the six million assassinated by the National Socialists and of the millions on millions of all confessions and all nations, victims of the same hatred of the other man, the same anti-Semitism. Now this is really interesting. He followed this second dedication with the names in Hebrew of his own family members who were murdered. Two important characteristics appear in these dedications. One, Levinas wrote from personal experience, though shared with unthinkably many others, of horror and loss beyond our ordinary conceptions of trauma. One way to read his philosophy is to read him as a traumatized person including residues in his work of traumatically generated dualisms and ethical blind spots of traumatic origin. If you're interested in seeing where he may have gone off the rails a bit politically, um, I would recommend Howard K. Gill's book, Levinas and the Political. Um, but secondly, Levinas clearly saw that every form of hatred of otherness shares the violence of anti-Semitism. As far as he's concerned, every way in which we hate otherness is the same as anti-Semitism. And he used the word in a very inclusive form. Beyond his own traumatic history, he saw every reduction of the other to the same as murderous. For him, concepts like positive aggression that the Gestalt therapists like, or used to like anyway, or engaging the patient's aggression that we find in contemporary psychoanalysis quite a bit, uh, especially I, I find in the interpersonal school, would be ethically unthinkable. He could, however, envision situations where ethical responsibility for the other could involve war. That's how strong the need to respond to the face of the suffering other could be. I could imagine his um, looking at the situation in Darfur and, and um, thinking about that anyway, at least, at least envisioning the possibility. At least three ideas express the primacy of ethics for Levinas, irreducibility, Proximity and substitution, we shall consider each in turn. Irreducibility is indispensable to the big idea of Emmanuel Levinas. The face into which I look and which places its infinite demand on me is not just a mask for the brain. Instead, for Levinas, as for all philosophical phenomenologists, Experience, especially of the other, escapes all formulations, representations, and mechanical descriptions. In his later work, especially in Otherwise Than Being, he contrasted the saying with the said. And this is really interesting. That the, that the process of saying something is alive, and as soon as it becomes a said, it, it isn't so much alive. And I, and I know as a clinical matter that with one of my patients, there will be times when she will say something extremely evocative, and I will think, wow, I need to remember that. And maybe a few days later, I will say it back to her, and she'll say, no, it doesn't work anymore. You know, it had, it just, it worked, it was, it was alive in the moment, it was a saying, but it had begun the said, and, and now it was just something that was in a file cabinet somewhere, you know. Um, it was no longer the living word, as, as, <sighs> Wittgenstein similarly had contrasted what could be said with what could only be shown. I think that the Levinasian saying, here I am, the, the hineni uh, to the other, rem resembles Wittgenstein's sh uh, showing. Proximity, another key word in Levinas, means to him both the nearness and the distance of our relationship to the other. 
Autrui is near because she or he leaves me no ethical space in which to turn away. The face of the other is near to me because it leaves me no ethical space in which I can turn away. But it's also distant because stand, it stands infinitely above and beyond me. Proximity is both near and far. It's never merged, and it's never um, um, disconnected. In proximity, he says, is heard a command come as from an immemorial past, which was never present, began in no freedom. This way of the neighbor is face. Levinas says in a lot of places that freedom is not the bottom line. We are captive to the face of the other. We are hostages. Ethics has not a thing in the world, he thinks, to do with freedom. That's a very interesting thought uh, to follow and pursue if you're interested. He says, my singularity is not a kind of self-identification. Instead, as summarized by Berlusconi, Robert Berlusconi is one of the foremost eth um, experts on, on Levinas. My singularity is unutterable, cramped, ill at ease. It is exposure to wounding and outrage. It is unable to take a distance from itself. It is radically responsible to the other prior to any contact or choice. That's what he means about freedom. That I'm responsible to the other before I'm free. It is uniqueness without interiority. Again, this is the my singularity, my minimalist singularity, is uniqueness without interiority, me without rest in itself, hostage of all, turned away from itself in each movement of its return to itself. And those are the words of Levinas himself. He often said in various places, it is my relation to the other that individualizes me. Insofar as I am an individual, it is through my relation to the other. Levinasian proximity, as the saying goes, afflicts the comfortable. I think that old saying about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, that would make sense to him. Levinasian ethics, though extreme, need not be spectacular. He thought that everyday courtesies that placed the other first, après vous, monsieur, uh, expressed his meaning well. What I have called emotional availability expresses this ethical attitude of responsibility or readiness to respond to the other. So there are lots of small little gestures. You know, when, when you hold the door open so that somebody with a stroller or a cane or somebody can get through, um, it, just any little thing that places the needs of the other first is a Levinasian, you know, is a way of being a Levinasian. Substitution, on the other hand, expresses the radical quality of Levinasian ethics. It means literally accepting the lot of the other, even death. And I think when he starts talking like this, he's thinking about all the bystanders who watched their Jewish neighbors loaded onto trucks and trains and taken off to the death camps. I think this is, the, this is where he's addressing the bystanders. Substitution, something we see in the subway passenger in early 2007, you, you probably most of you remember this, the one who threw himself into the path of an oncoming train to save one who had fallen onto the tracks, it never seems heroic to the one who does it. The firefighter, the doctor without borders, and so on. Instead we hear, I don't feel like a hero. Anyone would do it in my place. But we wonder, would we? The Levinasian subject is thus possessed in herself or himself only of a minimal, even pathetic, pathetic in the sense of suffering, subjectivity 
a respondent. I am a respondent, not a protagonist or even an agent. The Levinasian subject comes to being more or less fleetingly in response to the other. I come into being as a substitute for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. In another provocative formulation, Levinas says, I am hostage to the other without self-being. In striking contrast to Heidegger's dis designation of subjectivity as jemeinigkeit, mindness, or possession of my own being as my own, Levinas deposes this sovereign self. He says, for ethical thought, on the contrary, the self, as this primacy of what is mine, is hateful, unquote. Responding to the destitute face of the other, I become a first person only as a first responder, one who finds in my own empty hands the resources to answer the call. What happens to intersubjectivity in the asymmetry of Levinas? Husserl's conception of the intersubjective constitution of experience was one of his enduring interests and greatest contributions to the development of phenomenology. But late in life, asked whether the other is not also responsible toward me, Levinas responded, perhaps, but that is his affair. The intersubjective relation is a non-symmetrical relation. I am responsible for the other without waiting for reciprocity were I to die for it. Reciprocity is his affair. It is precisely insofar as the relationship between the other and me is not reciprocal that I am sub in subjection to the other and I am subject essentially in this sense. It is I who support all. As we noted above, he sometimes spoke of a curvature of intersubjective space. The implications of Levinas's radical asymmetry, we're almost done. I can substitute myself for everyone, but no one can substitute himself for me, seem impossible to live. How the contemporary psychotherapist or psychoanalyst may ask, can I help the other if I allow him or her to treat me as a hostage, imperiously, thus surrendering my own agentic subjectivity? This question contains a subtle but easily understandable misunderstanding of Levinas. The other is not being invited to mistreat me. Instead, I am responsible to his need and thus the hostage of his destitution. But Levinas also saw the problem of exhaustion, burnout, we call it, that his ethics could bring, and thus characterized society, legal systems, governments as the support system, the third party for ethical life. In many places, Levinas invoked the saying of Dostoevsky, we are all responsible for all men before all, and I more than all the others. Although there is no escape or limit to the demand that the face places upon me on the non-interchangeable I, there is a we in the third party sense and we are all responsible. Our responsibility for the other is what makes us human. Against the philosophical tradition that sees the conatus ascendi, that is the striving for to the struggle to persist in being, this is from Spinoza, but also invoked by many philosophers since, found also in Darwin and Freud, of course, as he, uh, that sees this as essential to being, Levinas instructs us, as he might say, wholly otherwise. I mean to say that a truly human life cannot remain life satisfied in its equality to being a life of quietude that it is awakened by the other, that is to say, it is always getting sobered up. That being is never, contrary to what so many reassuring traditions say, its own reason for being. That the famous Konata Sesendi is not the source of all right and all meaning. Such a human, now I say, such a humanism can never remain self-satisfied, triumphant, or comfortable. Instead, it is a prophetic humanism that comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable.
I can never say I have completed all my responsibility. I am never allowed to become complacent or self-satisfied. Like the concern for the other shown by my favorite 102-year-old, who was always concerned for the safety and well-being of others as long as she was conscious, Levinasian ethics never ends. Levinasian humanism does not exclude the idea of God, but in our humanist concern for the other human being, he often said, God comes to mind. Such a humanism is not a theory, an essentialism, or a said. It is instead the readiness to respond to the other that brings phenomenologically oriented therapists and analysts to our work that gets us up in the morning to take on once more our vulnerability as hostages in our work, recognizing the height of the other with whom we work. Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more. But the psychoanalytic phenomenologist has a special vocational burden captured well in the Levinasian requirement of asymmetry. Both Buber and Binsfanger, Binsfanger had also believed the teacher, the therapist, and the rabbi or pastor shared an obligation to treat the student, patient, or congregant as a you, as a thou, without expecting or even accepting reciprocity. But Levinas further defined the ethical relation the infinite responsibility for their as inherently asymmetrically, asymmetrical. It is therefore no surprise that we psychoanalytic phenomenologists seem drawn to theories and clinical attitudes that emphasize our responsibility to stretch empathically, to reach for contact, to understand, just as good enough parents do for many years without expectation of any adequate recompense. The parent is primary support for the development of the child's personhood and not vice versa, except in the situation of the parentified child for whom the needed support does not exist. Psychoanalysts and psychotherapists, I believe, work in a similar ethical rela relation of the asymmetrical type, like, parent, like good parents. So the phenomenologist accompanies the troubled, usually traumatized patient patiently, with good enough attunement to emotional life, both same and other, we join with a patient in the search for understanding without too much knowing. When we guess it may support dialogic reflection, we self-disclose a little. We attempt a minimally theoretical psychoanalysis, working with experience near concepts and holding our judgments and diagnostic impulses as lightly as we can. We stay close to our patients, finding our way together. We learn what we can from everyone, and we seek comfort and support, always needed, sometimes desperately, primarily from fellow phenomenologists. We face our infinitely demanding work with radical hope. Thank you. Thank you for that really inspiring paper. And George Hagman is the author of Aesthetic Experience, Beauty, Creativity, and the Search for the Ideal, 2005. He's on the faculty at NPAP as well as the Training and Research Institute for Self Psychology. He's published numerous articles in a variety of journals, including the Psychoanalytic Review, the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, and the Psychoanalytic Quarterly. Since 1999, he's been Director of Clinical Outpatient Services at the Southwest Connecticut Mental Health System, and he maintains a private practice in both Stanford, Connecticut, and here in New York, George Hagman. Hello, everybody, and um, thanks, Carl, for the introduction and also for inviting me to do this. I, uh, it was a total surprise to me, uh, and when I heard Donna was presenting, I, I was uh, both honored and um, a little intimidated. Can you hear? Can you hear me here? Oh, 
Oh, it goes up? Oh, great. Okay. Can somebody, who got that water? That was, th <laughs> thank you. I got a little bit of a cold, so. Thanks, Carl. Great, thanks very much. As a, uh, thank you. As a fellow uh, card carrying member, of the International Association for Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology, along with Donna. Of course, you know, nowadays self-psychology is a rather diverse, uh, complex, and within it, um, politically and theoretically riven um, type of organization. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to talk about Donna's work uh, with a very favorable point of view. Uh, much of what she said in the paper uh, really I agree with and I resonate with in terms of uh, my clinical work. Now, I'm not a philosopher. You know, maybe I was invited because I, I, th I, owe, I own a copy of Being in Time. <laughs> and I dug out a volume of Husserl. I did this preparation. I said, first off, I had to find out what phenomenology was. So I got out my encyclopedia of uh, philosophy that I got at the Strand and began to read the section on uh, phenomenology. And within 10 minutes, especially halfway through Husserl, I really didn't know what it was about. So I sort of said, well, listen, I'm not going to compete with her as a philosopher. So what I should do is fall back on myself as a clinician, a clinician who uh, has an interest in philosophy, at least to the extent that I, uh, un I misunderstand it enough so that I can actually use it uh, in my uh, work with, uh, with patients. Um, I, I see myself as sort of grasping some interesting ideas from philosophy um, and, and actually being able, I don't know whether I got it right, but it's often very helpful for me in terms of the work that I do and in thinking about um, uh, theory and about practice. So in terms of this discussion, it's really not a formal type discussion. What, I, what, what I'm going to be doing, um, actually Donna used the word, she said, well, this is sort of a riff on my paper. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take ideas that she wrote about in this wonderful paper of hers and not attempt to handle the philosophy, but to take these ideas and think about them and talk about them sort of coming to them from the point of view of my being a clinician, an analytic clinician, um, and um, uh, extending them s some implications in terms of the clinical work that we do. So that's, that's how I'm approaching this. <clears throat> the first thing that, that um, is that Don is proposing a new concept of mind and consciousness uh, that is very different from the analytic models that I was brought up on, um, the whole notion that we should really not think about repre inner representations, objects, self-objects, and stuff like that is very uh, different for me. And that's what I was trained in. That's how I have thought. Um, I've been interested in the, um, in the uh, uh, Fonagy and his group and um, still thinking in those terms. So this was very demanding for me in terms of her proposition of of, of focusing on lived experience and seeing these internal representations and the notion of them as being problematical. Um, I think she agrees with Husserl that concepts such as mind and consciousness be bracketed as preconceptions which prejudice us, perhaps even blind us to, quote, things themselves. At the very least, they are, as she had said, too concrete. They lack the complexity that we need. How is Donna's phenomenological model different from traditional psychoanalytic concepts, recognizing, of course, of course, that the idea of models, of these models, are not truths or even, quote, mirrors of the world, but language games? Mind, according to what I think Donna is talking about, is not a closed, isolated system, but open and even emergent from social exchange. Our experience of our own humanness can only crystallize in the context of our being anchored to and within a human ground. The world is never objective and external. It is always human. To create our world and the, our worlds and the language we use to describe them is in our own image. And that image is of ourselves in relationship to other people. 
We create language games by which we construct, manage, and cope with our life worlds. Um, Peter Maris, in his book, Loss and Change, talks about all, human me all meanings as being human ones, that all meanings in our life have to do with relationships. And uh, Bak Bakhtin, is that, um, uh, that, that even the most private thoughts are really dialogues um, with, with other people. Relationally organized human subjectivity includes an ethical and moral dimension. In fact, once you move beyond the Cartesian notion of an objective, isolated, and neutral knowing self, the inevitability of moral judgment and even moral ob obligation becomes central. The question of what we know becomes embedded in context and relationship. Emotion, interaction, passion, and complexity become the stuff of our experience of ourselves, embedded in relationships within a cultural, historical, and political context. Knowledge of the practical manifestation of ethics in human life becomes a central part of our phenomenology and epistemology. There's a wonderful book that, uh, written by Lorraine Code called um, What Can She Know? Feminist Theory and the Construction of Knowledge, where she talks about the difference between um, Western male forms of knowledge and um, feminine knowledge, uh, which is very consistent with what uh, what uh, Donna's paper is about. In other words, ourselves and our experience of our lives are inextricably tied to the welfare of others. Motivation solely for the sake of self-promotion is a dead end resulting in a contraction of self-experience and eventual death of the self. Maturity includes the enhancement of self-experience through acts of putting others first. Self-experience can never exist apart from relationships and society, but even more importantly, the protection, enhancement, and promotion of the welfare of others becomes a core component of the quality of self-experience. However, and this is one of the problems, I think, however, the welfare of others requires self-care as well. The other does not optimally, this is certainly me, the other does not optimally benefit if in the process we are harmed although this might in extreme instances be necessary if there is no alternative. Self-sacrifice is ultimately traumatic for the survivors, although living with trauma is, of course, part of human life. That being said, few of us have escaped the experience of significant failures in our relationships, leading to vulnerabilities and relational problems. Hence, relationships with others are always problematic. This is where the idea of this um, asymmetry becomes a problem for me since I certainly have a hard time uh, maintaining that. Even in the best of cases, the non-symmetrical relation can be difficult to engage in and sustain. There are days for each of us when going into the office for one more day of service to our patients seems impossible, unbearable. Donna and her discussion of Levinus points out how social institutions, I love the, this part, although I don't really understand it, uh, Levinus points out how social institutions provide essential functions in supporting us at these times. Perhaps it is the inevitable failure to do what should come naturally that requires the third party. Institutions of social regulation and justice. In our case, the institution of psychoanalysis as a professional practice plays a central part in our life world, most importantly our work and clinical relationships. We should not forget that as therapists and analysts, we are members of a middle class profession that has, one of, has been one of the defining social institutions of the modern age. We may be exquisitely intimate with our patients, but we are also professionals providing a quintessential service. In fact, I believe that it is the dialectic between our role as practitioners of a professional practice and persons in relationship with other people which creates the tension that brings into dynamic interaction the normal obligation towards others' welfare and the clinical, clinically potent technical intervention known as psychoanalysis. The concepts, methods, and values of analytic professional practice support the non-symmetrical relation, even when we are most self-involved and potentially disconnected. Psychoanalysis has at its core 
a set of ethical beliefs and obligations that compels us to value the subjective and non-rational, protects us from being too Cartesian and concrete, and keeps us attuned to the multidimensional human meetings which ebb and flow within us and between us as we talk with our patients. The social institution of, of analysis within which and through which we work also provides us and our patients at times with protection. Rather than being caught up in and taken over by the suffering of others, we are scaffolded, held up, and sustained by our role, which helps us to see, to know, and sustains our ability to accompany our patients even into the most painful or traumatized areas of experience. Unlike other helping professions, our caring for our patients is inextricably tied to the effectiveness of our interventions. I believe that's why many forms of psychotherapeutic practice are equally successful. Most therapists offer patients something that can be useful, but it is the value given to the therapy by the therapist's investment, the relevance of the method to the patient's experience, and the patient's acceptance of the therapist's concern and caring that makes for clinical potency. In the end, I believe this asymmetry is the factor that urges the patient towards greater health. Within the professional and subjective tilt of the analytic relationship, the patient's inherent capacity and motivation towards change is provided with resources and an opportunity to heal. In other words, this asymmetry tilts the patient's self-organization towards health. To a large extent, we must only get out of the way, even as we co-create the spiritual and emotion condi emotional conditions for growth. This begs the question of the phenomenology of health and illness. This is the, this is, a, I tried to sort of, in, in reading Donna's paper, is say, well, what does this model say about what uh, human illness, if you will, is and what health is? Optimally, people live their lives and cope with their life world in a responsive, flexible way, holding lightly to organizing principles which are tools, resources that aid them in, quote, getting and maintaining a grip, unquote. I wasn't sure where you got that term grip, but I, I found that. Uh, yeah, I found it a really wonderfully, uh, a wonderful term. Um, but anyway, these flexible, belief, these flexible organizing principles help in getting and maintaining a grip. People who seek therapy have trouble coping. They may have lost their grip, or they may have become entangled in conflicting meanings. The principles they live by are often fixed, invariant, rigid structures, which may have been useful and even essential in prior life worlds, especially in the face of traumatic disruption, or threats to self-organization. But they are no longer suitable for current or future life experience. One of, some of my papers I write about early parent loss. And I've had the, the fortune, I was fortunate enough to work with a number of people who lost their parents in childhood. And this is the issue that they, have, they developed within that life world of loss of the parent, particular ways of, of handling this emergency situation which then, of course, I'm sure everybody has experienced this, end up being um, operative in their 40s and 50s and impacting on their current functioning. Um, my observation has been that people suffer not so much from the contents of their thoughts, but the obsessive, compelling, and inflexible nature of these thoughts and feelings. One important issue, which Donna's paper doesn't get into, is the place of historical reconstruction in a phenomenologically oriented analysis. By engaging with our patients in analysis, we, quote, undergo a situation, unquote, with him or her, which is new, in which availability, readiness, responsiveness, and the willingness of the analyst to accept the other, place themselves in the background, and offer by means of dialogue and perhaps direct provision the resources, quote, resources to answer the other's call, unquote, are the conditions and context for change. This is another dialectic. I love that's, I don't, you know, I love the idea of dialectic in spite of my lack of, you know, 
understanding of philosophy. I think dialectic is a great idea. This is another dialectic, the reality that the patient heals him or herself, that nothing will change unless the patient wants it and is willing to make the change, and the reality that our interventions matter, that what we say and do has an effect, and that because our intent is the person's welfare, deeply felt and expressed, the patient makes use of us, thereby empowering his or her own self-healing. I believe that ultimately, a bi-directional, interpenetrating asymmetry involves within, involves within the treatment relationship. The analyst mu must not expect or demand that the patient have concern for him or her. There is recognition that the patient comes into being, however, in response to the analyst, who is acknowledged as someone, eventually acknowledged, as someone who suffers as well and to whom the patient is also held hostage. After all, a truly human life, and that should be the ultimate goal of any therapy, can never remain self-satisfied, triumphant, and comfortable. The ultimate function of analysis is to, quote, awaken, unquote, or sober up, unquote, the patient to the other and the inevitable responsibilities that this involves. Thank you all. Thank you. That was a, trying to think of a riff, which is you can't think about it. You have to just, just beyond. Yes, beyond instinct or, or intellect, beyond the papers, we have the questions. I know they're going to be good. Come on, there we go. Hello, um, I really appreciated uh, the topic today, um, and particularly um, philosophy being introduced into psychoanalysis. Um, sometimes uh, I've uh, experienced philosophy as a dirty word uh, in certain psychoanalytic uh, circles. Nonetheless, um, my question is uh, more philosophical than uh, psychoanalytic. Uh, so when, when, when I hear, um, you speak of the relationship, relation, um, and approaching it from a phenomenological standpoint. Um, I, I wonder what exactly is at stake in the term relation and relationship, particularly since phenomenologists, um, those that you've mentioned, Heidegger, Minus, Merleau-Ponte, the, the limit to, to one's perspective, and now even Levinas, this asymmetry with the, um, the um, standing above uh, the the self as other, um, how the relationship is to be experienced um, within this uh, sort of phenomenological uh, grounding or, or, or starting point. Um, and if you could just maybe speak to that um, in light of uh, your, your paper presentation. Thank you, and I think that that really um, points up you know, um, a little touch of sloppiness in the way that I presented it, but let me just say that I don't think there is any single view of relatedness or relation or even of intersubjectivity in the phenomenological movement, but, I, and that some phenomenologists certainly had a lot more interest in relatedness and forms of intersubjectivity than others. Um, the Husserl in his early years wa was Cartesian enough to write a whole book called Cartesian Meditations, uh, and only in his last years began to write about intersubjectivity and in the life world. Um, Heidegger uh, can be seen as having broken out of that completely with his idea of being in the world, and yet there isn't a sense in Heidegger of the real human other with whom one can, 
can be related. The other who's, for example, to lose the other would be, would make such a tremendous difference that it's all for Heidegger about my life. It's uh, Dasein's being in the world is always, um, he talks throughout being in the time about mindness. Uh, so that you have you have a really a, a range here, and then you've got people, uh, of course, like Martin Buber, who is not uh, strictly speaking um, a phenomenologist, but who has tremendously priv privileged the relation. His one of his famous sentences is, "In the beginning is the relation before everything." Uh, then you, and then of course you've got um, Levinas, who's <laughs> would say in the beginning is the other. You know that that the face of the uh, that he he faulted Buber for not recognizing how radically asymmetrical the ethical relation is. So you've got you've just got a range of different ways from one philosopher to the next in the ways that they talk about this. But there's lots to get into and to think about, and uh, not there's certainly not a, a set of consistent ideas even in the things I presented to you tonight. Not all the ideas hang perfectly together, but there's a lot of um, probably the one thing that hangs together throughout all of these people is the focus on lived experience as opposed to the focus on categories and um, uh, diagnoses and general generalizations that Levinas would have called totalizing and uh, Husserl would have called the natural attitude, and you know there were almost all all the phenomenologists had have have an allergy to what you might call psychiatry speak. So, so that just to, just for you know a way of thinking about that. I don't know if that's helpful, but it's it's there are some commonalities, but the particular point you bring up, there's a lot of, of variability. I have this thing about in terms of psychoanalytic practice, um, with this radical um, otherness, how then do we... The Jaffa uh, article by Monroe Prey. Lack of better word, the subjectivity, the, the, uh, the self in the other, when it's so radically other, it's, it's so radically different, it's this hit, that yeah. um, this is the, the end point. Infinite, yeah. So how, in terms of practice, how would we uh, be more relational? Yeah. Uh, more intersubjective. I mean, it almost sort of, it almost sort of prohibits a meeting of mind yeah. or Yeah. I don't think he's saying that the other is infinitely different from me. He's saying that the other places an infinite demand and responsibility upon me and and but that it's not a demand for understanding in the sense of reduction to a category it's a demand for response for an open-hearted here here you know an open-hearted and open-handed response and that the the presumption i think that that i have to have at least the minimal capacity to see to see the the other's face to see and recognize the suffering in the other's face um, certainly presumes that we have a common humanity that underlies this ethical um, uh, uh, obligation I think it does anyway I don't know if that helps or not. Uh, Donna, I'm going to I'm going to just ask a question that's that's linked with that. Sure. Um, <coughs> last, let me try to formulate this. Um, in the in the infant mother caretaker uh, relationship. The demand, I mean, it seems to me that, that 
that these, um, these descriptions are versions of that first human relationship. You have the individual who's born, you have the other, and there's a relationship. And the idea that the face of, of the mother um, puts this pressure uh, on the infant to be, uh, it, its height is there, um, its demands are there, and yet the infant is an individual at, at birth before the relation and I'm not talking prenatally now, but just from, from birth on, um, begins with certain autonomic responses, like breath. The, the infant inspires and, and takes in the world that, that then begins the infants, and at, at that point may then face the mother with their own face, but it's only with an expiration of their inspired breath. So I'm wondering whether the, the demand and in the beginning is the relationship is, isn't uh, uh, that, that there's an argument there between the philosophers as to the, um, let me get the word, the, uh, the individualness I mean, we're, we're talking here about in individualness versus a relation. Um, we, are, we are part of the species automatically, so we are in relation. But before we meet the other, we are an individual with our own um, uh, autonomous, uh, even though autonomic response. You know, I don't know whether this is really a question about Levinas and the ethical so much as it's a question about intersubjectivity generally and about, especially about our version of intersubjective systems theory as a field or systems theory where we claim that um, human life is intersubjective all the way down, as the philosophers like to say. That is, that is to say that there is no pre intersubjective okay. moment. And, um, or, and th that there is no, um, uh, um, the, 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 no time in which uh, the, there isn't an implicit intersubjectivity. I think George referred to something like, like that. Um, that, that um, uh, even when we feel alone, we, uh, that we are feeling alone in reference to an, uh, a, a, a community that's lacking. There's something, there's, there's a relatedness that's lacking, that, that is experienced as lacking. Now, um, it, I don't think that anyone would argue that you can't, you know, put one person in one chair and, and the other in the next and, and enumerate that one is here and two is there and three is here and four is there and that these are single individuals in the sense that you can count them. That's, but that's, that's not the level of, at which we're talking psychoanalytically at all. We're not talking about people as countable. We're talking about people as experiential. And we're talking about, um, and, and so I think in any level that we would be thinking about as, as psychoanalytic, we would be arguing for intersubjectivity all the way down. William James um, is, is the one who's supposed to have started this story about all the way down, you know, where. Uh, the, the, at the end of a lecture one time, a woman is supposed to have come up to him and said, you know, Dr. James, um, did you know that the world was uh, founded on a turtle? 
And he said, oh, is that, that, you know, that's interesting, you know, and what is the turtle standing on? And, and she said, oh, it's, another, it's standing on another turtle. And, oh, and what is that turtle standing on? Oh, another turtle. Oh, Dr. James, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> the philosophers love to use this expression that something is whatever it is all the way down, that there's never a point where that, so we talk about intersubjectivity sometimes all the way down, that there's no, never a point where there's no relatedness involved. So. I think we have time for just one, one more question. Because we have one more difficult time here. Um, I want to thank you also. This, this really makes you think, and, and to very stimulating and actually very evocative, and, and makes me feel I have to go back to my philosophical foundations, start another career. Wonderful. Right? And this, it was a very good evening then. Really was, <laughs> really was. And, and I think, I mean, for myself, here's where I am. Um, I'm just thinking of a tension, the tension that I'm having between the world of philosophy and ethics, and then the world of clinical work and even developmental psychology. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, we're trying to bridge worlds tonight, I am, and listening to you, bridging worlds. Um, if, I, if I think of ethics, for example, I start with ethics. I'm, I'm thinking of Kant. I'm thinking of maybe a utilitarian form also of ethics, and I'm thinking of a contextual form of ethics. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, what you're talking about tonight might be kind of coming from the latter, the contextual idea, that uh, the, the sense of the self being uh, constantly in a form of interaction and very relative to the other. But I think the difficulty, and this is, I think, the tension is to move from the whole idea of ethics and all that that takes us, which does move me into a very abstract world, and then moving it now into the world of working with the other clinically and back into developmental. Because even if you're thinking of Kant, which I understand the categorical and, 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 and that level, in a sense, Kant himself, when he makes a categorical imperative, he, he really is talking about the nature of man to man. He is saying, how do I, how do, what is my basic principle here? The basic principle is that I will do, we will do to each, we can only do with each other what, what we would do to ourselves. I mean, it, it's in a sense, it's a very reflective of a relational, a relational, in the, you know, a relational, a point of a relational perspective. It's just different level, you know, and I see it in, in a sense where they're all dealing with this level of humane connection, yeah. but it's the level of it in that sense. Yeah. And, and I Absolutely. get the contextualism and the fluidity of the self is very sure. complex. You know, I think that Kant was one of Levinas's inspirations. And, uh, and of course, I think for us who work in the worlds of empathy, um, the idea that we, uh, tr empathy, I think of as in some ways an effort of imagination, uh, to imagine how it would feel to be in the other's shoes and how we would want to be treated if we were in the other's shoes. That's a very basically Kantian ethical idea. And um, when Levinas talks about responding to the destitute and naked and suffering face of the other, it's not so very far from that kind of idea. Levinas told a, a story, and he wrote very little about his time in the camps. Uh, but he said that, um, you know, the Jewish prisoners were made to work much harder than the others. This was a, a prisoner of war camp for the French officers, which he was. And he, they, when the Jewish prisoners were marched back from their work details at the end of the day, it turned out that for a while there, there was a dog that attached himself to their camp. 
and this dog would jump up and down and bark and greet them and carry on when they came back to the camp. And he said, you know what? This dog didn't know that we weren't human. This was the last Kantian in, La in Nazi Germany, he said. <laughs> that dog, that's what he said, that dog was the last Kantian in, in Nazi Germany. He said, he said the dog knew, the dog didn't know that we weren't human. So I'm just commenting on your, what you said. Um, thank you very much, George, for your discussion. I felt very well understood. Thank you. And, and thank you both for a wonderful evening.